Hello, this is Shambhavi. Welcome to Satsang. Satsang is an ancient spiritual practice from India. It means being in reality together. I give Satsang live every Wednesday and Sunday night in Portland, Maine. This Dharma talk was recorded during one of our Wednesday night gatherings. Please visit jayakula.org to learn more about the teachings. You can find video satsangs on Jayakula's YouTube channel, and my books are all available on Amazon.com. Much love to you, wherever and however you are. One of the names of Lord Shiva is the auspicious. And Shiva, of course, is all of existence. We have a personification of something called Lord Shiva. We can see pictures of him on Facebook. <laughs> uh, maybe there was some yogi way back when. It was, you know, the original. But really what is meant by Lord Shiva is all of existence. And one of the main names of Lord Shiva is the auspicious. So that is indicating that there's nothing here but auspiciousness. Sometimes people say, I'm so blessed. Usually they're bragging when they do that. I'm so blessed to have been given this award. (laughs) You see that a lot these days. (laughs) Uh, But sometimes people do feel that they're specially blessed or that some period or in their lives is especially wonderful or something that happens is especially great and that they're very blessed because of that. But the truth is that there is only auspiciousness and everybody is equally blessed. (laughs) What does that mean in practical terms? It means that Whenever anything happens in your life, you are one being communicated to by an alive, aware reality, alive, aware existence itself is communicating something. Because this entire experience is a communication. It means that as a practitioner, you have an opportunity, no matter what is happening to you or in your life, to look to find where in that experience is being communicated your work, your work order, your message for you about how you can best work to wake up right now. As practitioners, we are not being fake and pretending that we don't have feelings when things, as we say, go wrong. Nothing's ever really going wrong. Everything's just going. (laughs) And all goings are exactly the same. They're all equal. They have equality. They don't have equal gunas, they don't have equal flavors and textures, they don't have equal emotions, but equality is their nature. Everything that's happening has equality on the most fundamental level. So we're not relating to things uh, by trying to deny our emotions or not feel anything but we're relating to things to look for what work are we being asked to do to wake up more. When you're a little more in touch with living presence, then you can actually feel the goodness of everything. You can actually feel the compassion of everything. 
you can feel that there isn't anything but auspiciousness. You can have that experience directly. It becomes something other than a slogan. And in fact, when it's something other than a slogan, then it becomes more difficult. <laughs> because you're in charge of a slogan. <laughs> you can wield a slogan whenever you like. And then when it doesn't suit you, you can moan and groan and, you know, forget about that slogan about how you're blessed. When you feel like complaining and moaning and groaning, then you just put your slogan aside. And then when you feel like picking it up again because it suits you, you know, you can do that. But when you are actually experiencing the mercy and compassion of this entire existence, then no matter what you want to do with any particular experience, there's always that staring you in the face, challenging you to find the wisdom in what's happening to you. Right. So this uh, experience of direct presence, of directly realizing, directly experiencing the living and intelligent compassionate quality of existence, of this base existence, of this livingness, what we call Lord Shiva, the auspicious, is it is the ultimate refuge, but it's also extremely challenging. We are trained to celebrate in an ordinary way when wonderful things happen and to uh, be, feel badly about life when things go wrong. But when we have this direct experience of auspiciousness, then we are challenged to find the goodness in everything. And that's very, very difficult when we don't want to. When we'd rather bitch and complain <laughs> And it's interesting that uh, working with that, it's interesting working with that on a day-to-day -day level where you feel put upon by life or you feel unnourished or you feel attacked or you feel, you know, the absurdity of what's going wrong in your life or you feel you've tried and tried and tried and tried and tried and nothing's going the way that you want it to. Uh, it's very difficult to then look goodness in the face, look auspiciousness in the face and ask yourself, what is being communicated to me? It's not always obvious. Sometimes things have to be taken away so we can find out what we really want. the entire reality for us as practitioners is moving us toward having our desire be focused in one direction. It's, it's organizing our lives so that eventually we can bring everything onto the path of our realization. And so we are like constantly straying into different directions. Our ambivalence and our resistance is all about that karmic momentum that's telling us that other things are more important or that is preventing us from seeing that we can have a full life and still have everything be part of our spiritual path. You know, it, it causes us to compartmentalize and create false dichotomies and contradictions between different parts of our lives. And so as practitioners, we are being guided to eventually let go of all those false contradictions and compartments, to have our desire become one with that river of movement toward awakening. And so there are different ways that we're being shown the depth of our feeling and the depth of uh, how our nature is aligned with that movement towards waking up. And many, many things happen. There's a wonderful line from the 
a divination book, the Joey, which says, uh, I'm just paraphrasing, but that there's that this is a moment of what is hardened and false falling away. So we have many false ideas about ourselves, many hardened, crusty ideas about ourselves and about life and how everything should be. And one of the main ways that this reality and our teachers uh, help us to relinquish what is false and hardened is by not giving us what we want. When our karmic self, our small eye, doesn't get what it wants, then we're confronted with, well, what do I really want? And we have to go inside and reach more deeply to discover that. We also are confronted when we don't get what we want with the way in which we had wrapped our identity around some idea of success in getting what we want. When we don't get what we want, we also discover the falsity, we discover the falsity of many of ideas about ourselves. We have to contemplate that. Uh, and we come up against our stubbornness and our stubborn, the stubbornness of our desire. So when that happens, and it inevitably happens, and as practitioners, those are the moments when we're not getting what we want. Uh, when we have to most courageously reach for the auspiciousness in the situation. Now, a, a common error, because we live in a Judeo-Christian culture, is to think that we're being punished, and that the lesson is punishment. Right? The lesson is never punishment. Punishment is a is a contrived human idea. I'm sure there's other species that have ideas of punishment too. But we are never being punished. We're never having our wrist slapped or anything else. We're only ever encountering the wisdom of a situation. We're always being invited to discover the wisdom in any situation. And very, very often, discovering that wisdom means that something has to be taken away from us. So the biggest blessings are often failures. Because it's very easy when we're comfortable and when we're winning, uh, it's very easy to stop challenging ourselves in certain ways and to not um, it's harder to rein in our karmas or, karmas or to do the work of letting those tensions go when things seem to be going well. However, you do learn to do that too. Right? If you have enough failure and you learn well from that failure, then you also learn not to be attached to success. They come together. Not being attached to uh, the suffering of failure and understanding that failure is revealing wisdom also helps us to not be attached to success. To not get so wrapped up in when things are going well. We begin to see the kind of undulation of life and how it's, things are always changing and that there's the same wisdom in all of it, in success and failure, and, and everything in between. And that really our only job is to look for that wisdom, regardless of what is happening. So I'm not saying that we don't celebrate successes, and I'm not saying that we don't feel sad when things go wrong. That would be uh, like cutting out some of the colors on the palette. <laughs> but I am saying that... Um, it's failure that really teaches us non-attachment as practitioners. And once having been able to practice non-attachment and devotion to wisdom during the times when we're not getting what we want and things seem to be going awry, if we can maintain devotion to that search for the wisdom in a situation and devotion to following that wisdom, and being honest and courageous with ourselves, reevaluating things. Right? 
uh, changing our self-concept or letting go of hardened and false self-concept. That doesn't usually happen when things are going well. <laughs> so I'm giving this talk because some couple of students of mine are having a very rough day. Uh, and it seems appropriate to talk about this. The ways in which not getting what we want teaches us are very subtle, not always obvious. And as you progress in your spiritual practice, you are kind of trained by the fall of false expectations of yourself and other people, false contradictions, false compartmentalization and self-concept. You're kind of trained by the falling away of all that to recognize the language of failure, to recognize all the different ways in which failure can talk to you and teach you what you need to know and where you need to go. So simply throwing up your hands when something doesn't go right and say, oh, I guess that wasn't meant to be, that's kind of a cop-out. It was meant to be that this situation arose and now it's your job to look for the wisdom. How are you being communicated to? What is being said about how you have conducted yourself and what you expected and what self-concept you, you had going into some particular situation? and what degree of dishonesty about yourself, and what degree of fixation. What fixation is being undermined by this situation that you're in? That's the wisdom of the situation, is that it's undermining fixation, or trying to, if we would just listen to it. And so then we have to, we have to do the work to recognize that, though. We have to do the work to approach situations like that. What is really challenging for me about this situation? What is trying what is being undermined here? And you start it helps you to feel your karmic patterning more, right? And to recognize it more fully and to feel the sort of impulses of your fixation as they arise and don't get met don't get what they want. You know, they're just like, they arise and it's like, uh, and then they're just there for you to look at. <laughs> this is a big part of the practice. Swami Satyananda famously said that his method in working with students was to give them nothing they wanted and everything they didn't want. <laughs> <laughs> but as you progress in your practice and you start to wake up more, you'll, you'll see that all of reality is working with you. It's not just your teacher. Everything is working with you. And you only get the responsibility of things going really well. Everything's always going well. So I'm just using this relativistic language. Everything is always going well. <laughs> but in relative terms, you only get the responsibility of things going well as a practitioner when you can handle it with a certain degree of detachment. Otherwise, if you're not doing that, if you're just ignoring the wisdom of situations, you can either be put in a situation of extreme disappointment or failure, or you can put in a be put in a situation of extreme success where reality starts feeding all of your karmas full on mm -hmm. and then just drops you off a cliff at some point. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but when we can really f be courageous and face the wisdom of a situation and really do that work to learn that wisdom and to let go of false concepts and relax very, very deeply in the face of so-called failure, then the situation just changes. That's when enormous growth takes place. You know, during those times when you're just kind of crawling around on the ground looking for something, you know, 
those are the times when the most growth is actually happening. It's not about looking for success. It's yeah. about being able to feel the goodness in every moment. So any of you that have even had any taste of more relaxation or openness, you, know, you want to work really hard to find your way back there. You're not just sitting around in between little moments of relaxation saying, oh, you know, I have a hard time with this, I have a hard time with that. If you have any moments like that, you try to find your way back there. That's your job. Not to just sit and wait for something to happen. I know you have had experiences of greater peace and relaxation and feeling that presence, and it's your job to work like hell to get back there, to find your way until you know the way. That's your responsibility. It's nobody else's responsibility. No one can do that for you. It takes just doing it with the understanding that you just don't have any other refuge. Nothing else is going to give you what you want. There is no job. There is no uh, boyfriend or girlfriend. There is no psychotherapy. There is no wealth. There is, there is nothing that can resolve the complaints that you've been making your whole life other than to do the work to get find a way back to those moments. And you have to do that. It's really all on your plate. The only thing that a teacher can do is try to help you to have that experience a little more often to make it a little easier to find your way back there. And it's okay to complain as long as you're still making the effort to go back. <laughs> I'm just giving myself an excuse because, you know, I like to complain. But, <laughs> but the truth of the matter is you can be anything and also be totally determined to get back there. You can doubt. You can be upset. But as long as you make that effort, it's all, it all works out. You have to keep reaching for that. You have to just keep reaching for it. And it's your responsibility to do that and no one else's. Jayakula is a nonprofit community offering opportunities to learn and practice in the direct realization traditions of Trika Shaivism and Dzogchen. We are based in Portland, Maine and Portland, Oregon. Visit jayakula.org to explore more of our offerings.